All right. Hello, everybody. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Bienvenue, bienvenue aux panélistes et aux membres du public. Je vous remercie de vous être joints aujourd'hui en si grand nombre. It is a pleasure for us at Virtual Force Space to collaborate with the School of Graduate Studies and today's presenting students to bring you Concordia's three-minute thesis competition. Nous aimerions commencer par reconnaître que l'Université Concordia est située en territoire autochtone lequel n'a jamais été cédé. Nous reconnaissons la nation Kanyankahaga comme gardienne des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. Jojage, Montréal, est historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour les de nombreuses na Premières Nations pardon, et aujourd'hui une population autochtone diversifiée ainsi que d'autres peuples y résident. C'est dans le respect des liens avec le passé, le présent et l'avenir que que nous reconnaissons les relations continues entre les peuples autochtones et autres personnes de la communauté montréalaise. We are recording this event and live streaming on Facebook, and I'll pop those links into the chat now. And on that note, good luck to all the participants. To our moderator, Concordia Public Scholar, PhD candidate, and past 3MT runner-up, Sylvie Ouellet. Over to you, Sylvie. Thank you, Anna. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2021 Concordia Three Minute Thesis Competition. My name is Sylvie Wallet. I will be Master of Ceremonies this afternoon. Bonjour et bienvenue au concours Ma Thèse en 180 secondes, le neuvième à être tenu ici à Concordia. Mon nom est Sylvie Wallet et je serai maître de cérémonie cet après-midi. Thank you for joining us to support our participants. You know, an important part of research is able to share it with people who are not experts in our field and to convince them of its importance. Um, we have, let me just start my screen sharing for now. So here. There. there we see, sorry about that. Um, we appreciate your encouragement and support to our participants. Like uh, Anna just said, last year I was uh, participating in this competition myself. And you know, when we envisage a research project, we have so many details to take into account, uh, all, all the background, the methods, the results, and condensing all of this in three minutes with only one illustration to convey the message is quite a challenge, but it is feasible. And this is why we're all here today. So to our presenters, just remember that you've worked very hard. I've, I've seen you at work. Uh, to make it to this stage, I'm, I'm confident you'll all be excellent. And to the audience, we are excited um, for you to hear these presentations and that highlight uh, the great research that's taking place at Concordia. So here's a brief overview. I can't seem to be able to move my slide. Let me start again. Some reason I cannot move to the next slide. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. So this is a brief overview of uh, the the program for today. So after an opening remarks given by Dr. Brad Nelson, Associate Dean of Academic Programs and Development, we will proceed with our master's presentations. When the master's presentations are done, we will move into the people's choice vote for this category. This is when uh, the public, the audience, will be able to vote for their favorite presentation, and we will send out a link at that time for you to cast your vote. Then we'll move on onto the doctoral presentations. Here we have presenters in both English and French for the three minute thesis competition and its French equivalent, Ma thèse en 180 secondes. Again, this will be followed by the people's choice vote and when you can cast your vote for that level of presentation. At this point, while we wait for the judges to compile the final tally, we will have a short Q&A section, uh, Q &A, um, session, sorry. So if you have questions for our presenters, please refrain from posting anything at the moment. We will open the Q&A uh, function on Zoom and on Facebook when the time comes and you will be prompted uh, when that happens. So, and of course, once we have uh, the final decisions from the judges, we will move on to the announcements. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Brad Nelson, Associate Dean of Academic Programs and Development and Professor of Classics, Modern Languages and Linguistics, who will be providing a brief overview of this competition. Merci, Sylvie. Um, I'm delighted to be able to welcome everyone to this milestone three-minute thesis competition and Mathez en 180 secondes competition at Concordia. 
Today we're actually hosting the tenth. Uh, the the, the t this is the tenth time we're celebrating this annual event. Over the past ten years, the 3MT has brought very much pride to Concordia. Um, we, including myself, have had the pleasure of coaching hundreds of students on their research pitches. We have watched our students blossom from jargon riddled, rambling, uh, somewhat cryptic scripts to creating compelling, thought provoking, entertaining, and inviting stories. And I'd like to extend a special thanks to all our coaches and a very special thanks and a congratulations to Christy Clark and Rasha Sheikh Ibrahim who are the primary movers and shakers of Concordia's 3MT uh, events. I'm happy to say that I've been there often in the front row uh, for many, if not all of the competitions. I've even had the pleasure of seeing our winners compete nationally and internationally in the three minute thesis competitions hosted by the Northeastern Association of Graduate Schools, the Canadian Association of Graduate Schools and the Council of Graduate Schools, which is a pan US uh, Canadian Association, uh, as well as the Francophone competition, Mathez en 180 secondes, hosted by ACVAS. It should not go without mention that our graduate students have gone on to win these competitions. Notably, Vanessa Mardarosian, doctoral candidate in the individualized program, won third place in 2020 at the Final Nacional de Mathez en 180 secondes. Nusha Arezi, a Master's of Science graduate from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, won the top Canadian prize in 2019. And finally, Ana Maria Medina Ramirez, an MSc graduate from Mechanical Engineering, took second place in 2016. All of them beating out thousands of other competitors from across the country and uh, across the northeastern part of the US and Canada. Seeing these students recognized for their hard work and innovative research has made us all very proud to be part of this proven graduate professional development and research mobilization program. For those listeners who are tuning into their first 3MT competition, I'd like to take a moment to provide a little background on the event. The first competition was at the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008, but it quickly became a worldwide event. Now it's held in approximately 900 universities in 85 countries. The competition has also been adapted to other languages, including the French version, Mathez en 180 secondes. The challenge of the 3MT is for graduate students to clearly communicate the essence and importance of the research to a non-specialist audience with just one static PowerPoint slide. So imagine after spending months or years toiling away at your research, than having to squeeze it into a three minute summary without diluting or omitting major points, a challenge worthy of any mind. I can tell you that this morning I was at a conference in Kentucky and I felt it very difficult to jam my paper into 20 minutes. So three minutes, uh, that, that's quite a task. According to the University of Queensland, it takes almost nine hours to present an 80,000 word thesis. And despite our growing ability to binge watch nine hours of the latest Netflix series, I doubt anyone is up for a nine hour thesis presentation today. This year we invited all our graduate students to participate in this competition. 64 students joined our coaches and we ended up with 13 finalists in today's competition. In an effort to keep today's Zoom event short and sweet, we held prior elimination heats to select six masters and six doctoral finalists as well as one finalist for Mathez en 180 secondes competition. Our judges will select a winner and runner up in both the masters and doctoral categories after their presentations. And you or we, the audience, will also have the opportunity to vote for a People's Choice Award in both categories, which Sylvie will explain after the participants' presentations. From our finalists, one student will be selected to represent Concordia University at the 3MT Eastern Regional Final Competition in June. Our Francophone presenter will represent Concordia at the ACFAS competition in May. I salute all the participants for their courage to accept the challenge, especially in this year's online environment. I wish you all the best of luck and it's your time to shine. I'll now invite Sylvie, our doctoral runner-up from last year's competition to introduce our judges. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Nielsen. Yes, I would like to introduce our judging panel. Our esteemed judges who have graciously accepted the, to give us their time this afternoon. They have the tough job of selecting today's winners. So first we have Dr. Ursula Eicher, Canada Excellence Research Chair for Smart, Sustainable and Resilient Cities and Communities here at Concordia. A German physicist, Dr. Eicher has held leadership positions at the Stuttgart University of Applied Sciences and its Center for Sustainable Energy Technologies. In her team, more than 50 graduate students work on pathways to zero carbon cities within the built environment, renewable energy, sustainable transport, and circular economy. Our second judge is Dr. Milagros Salas Prato, a medical researcher, former assistant research professor at University de Montréal, visiting associate professor at UCLA, and the president and CEO of the Anne Cellier Foundation. Dr. Salas Prato received her BSc in biology chemistry from Concordia. Following these studies, she went on to McGill University and then to University of Montreal to pursue MSc and PhD degrees in experimental medicine and surgery. Our third judge is Dr. Eric Filion, postdoctoral post fellow in the Department of History at University of Toronto, where he pursues his work on cultural diplomacy and examines music festivals as sites of contestation in the Canadian cultural public sphere. Dr. Filion was a member of the 2018-2019 Public Scholar Cohort and was named valedictorian for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences upon earning his PhD in 2019. So thank you judges for your time this afternoon. We are honored to have you here. We're, I'd like now to give a very brief overview of the rules of the competition. This is important because you, the audience, will also take on the role of judges through your votes for the People's Choice Award. So participants can only use one PowerPoint slide without animations. Additional electronic media and props are not allowed. Presentations are limited to three minutes and competitors exceeding this time will be disqualified. And of course, the decision of the judges is final. Now, for the judging criteria, these uh, criteria comprises two main axes, comprehension and content, along with engagement and communication. So this first criteria, comprehension and content, here we're asking, did the presenter use clear jargon-free language that can be understandable to a general audience, such as yourselves? And did the presentation follow a logical sequence? Did the presenter spend enough time on each element of their presentation? And for the second criteria, engagement and communication, we'd like to know, did the presenter capture and maintain your, your, in, your attention through all this? Did they inspire you to know more? Did their PowerPoint slide really enhance the presentation was clear, legible, concise? Now, for prizes, because of course this is a competition, there are prizes involved, both winners at the master's and the PhD level will receive an award of $750. The runner-ups will each receive 150 and the people's choice winners will each receive a hundred dollars one at the master's level one at the doctoral level so for each level you will be invited to vote at during separate sessions so the voting will take place after each of these levels have completed their presentation uh, we will post a link on the chat box and on facebook for you to vote when the time comes you will have approximately five minutes i'll give you a short reminder towards the end and we'll do the same at the end of the doctoral presentations. Naturally, uh, we'd like you to join in the conversation. We encourage you to post about this event on social media using hashtag 3MTCU2021 or hashtag Canada3MT, as well as tagging us at GradProSkills on Twitter or Facebook. And now let's begin with the master's presentation and let's wish all the participants good luck. The first Presenter, presenter is Amanda Dunbar from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Amanda is pursuing a Master of Arts in Child Studies. Her thesis title is Spark Notes Use Among High School English Language Arts Students, and her three minute thesis title is Reading versus Reading Sparks Notes and High School English Class. Good luck, Amanda. High school English classes have been reading the same books for generations. No matter how old you are, I bet you read classics like 1984, To Kill a Mockingbird, or The Great Gatsby. What I'm wondering is, did you read them or did you read them? Reading versus reading is a big topic in education. 
a lot of students have noticed that they can still get pretty decent grades in their English classes, even if they don't read the books. Teachers talk about this all the time, but the issue of students not reading the books that they study has never been explored in an official way. This is where my research comes in. My research looks at one of the things that makes reading possible, which is a website called SparkNotes. If you've ever heard of Cole's Notes or Cliff's Notes, SparkNotes is the same thing only online. So it's a place to go for character descriptions, summaries, and anything else you might need to make it look like you've read a book. My research asks the question, how big of a deal is SparkNotes use in high school English? To answer this question, I'm asking 250 people who took high school English class since the year 2000 in Montreal and elsewhere to tell me about their high school reading habits through a short anonymous survey. As of today, about half the responses have come in. And so far, two out of every three people have said that they used SparkNotes when they were in high school. This research matters because right now, reading is an open secret. I saw one article that described it as teachers pretending to teach and students pretending to learn. Frankly, I think we can do much better than that. If we acknowledge that reading is a thing that happens sometimes, we can plan for it. For example, sometimes it's probably fine for students to learn about a famous book without actually reading it. But in other cases with certain books, the whole point is that feeling of transportation that you get as a reader. This is especially important for struggling students because research has shown that the amount they read can really affect their chances for success later on. So how about you? Were you a reader, a reader, or were you both? Personally, I was both, and so were most of the people in my study so far. So were most of the people in my study so far. When I was in high school, I read 1984 and I read To Kill a Mockingbird, but I read The Great Gatsby. And I don't think my high school teachers ever even knew the difference. I realized that with this research, I'm outing myself, but I just think we have so much room for improvement in the way we teach English to high schoolers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Our next presenter is Jenny Ann Gagnon from Faculty of Arts and Science. Jenny Ann is pursuing a master in science of science in biology. Her thesis title is Gut on a Chip Platform Sensing the Inflammation Level. And her three minute thesis title is Gutomize Your Cure for Cancer. Good luck, Amanda. On the picture on the left, you can see Aubrey trying to comfort her little brother, Beckett, who was diagnosed with leukemia. After Beckett's diagnosis, they both went from playing together to sitting together in a cold hospital room. Did you know that this will also be the story of one children out of 400? So for those of you who don't know about childhood leukemia, the current treatment implies many, many drugs, countless side effects, and really there is no silver bullet to cure it. So the reason for this is that everybody's gut is different. This is why every children react so differently to the same exact treatment. So how can we tackle this major challenge? Well, I might just have the right solution for you. As a researcher in biology, what I propose is to create a tool that can be used for personalized gut, which means that I can place any children's gut on this device. I can make one of those guts right in the palm of my hand in less than a day and let you know what is wrong with your child in less than a week. And I can do this for any children who is diagnosed with leukemia. These personalized gut devices could be a great model for every possible child out there, allowing to test and design new drugs that are personalized to the child. So far, I could develop this device, grow alive gut cancer cells in it, recreating this living intestine outside of the human body. So my next goal will be to test different chemotherapy drugs and observe how the gut reacts to them. So I will analyze how these drugs affect different guts. Now imagine this, your three years old son is diagnosed with leukemia. Normally you would go to the hospital, 
sit there in agony, trying to understand what is wrong with your child? Just like in the story of Beckett and Aubrey. But what if we could develop a fast and easy solution to understand what is wrong with your child right in the palm of your hand? Well, maybe with these personalized gut devices, we can finally reach the silver bullet for every possible child who is diagnosed with leukemia. Maybe we can find an excuse for childhood cancer. Maybe children like Aubrey and Beckett can go back to playing together. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Our second presenter, uh, sorry, <laughs> Jenny Ann. Um, our next presenter is Sarah Hamed from the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. Sarah is pursuing a Master of Applied Science in Industrial Engineering. Her thesis title is A Maturistic Approach to the a New Variant of the Location Routing Problem. And her three minute thesis title is We Can Do Better. Good luck, Sarah. Life does not come with a lot of guarantees, but if one thing should be guaranteed, it's free high quality healthcare, regardless of who you are or where you seek it. And it's fair to say that even where healthcare is free, there is always room for it to be better. Canada has a great system where taxes fund healthcare. 150 billion tax dollars fund the fifth most expensive healthcare in the world. So why aren't you getting this billion dollar worth of quality care? Because to actually provide this, the government needs to reduce costs wherever they can. And a lot of these cost-saving opportunities are actually invisible to patients. For example, healthcare networks need a lot of things moved from bed sheets to blood samples. And all these moving can add up to 30% of costs. That's $40 billion that can be used addressing real problems in Canadian healthcare, like reducing waiting time or getting better equipment. But how? How do transportation costs add up to 30%? Because transportation is actually answering a series of very expensive questions. Which trucks should I use? Should I do the whole delivery or do I drop it to the closest post office? What order to do the deliveries in? And the hardest question, can I do better? What makes it even harder is that I need these questions answered on a regular basis. So my goal is to help the Ministry of Health in Quebec not only answer how can they reduce their transportation costs, but to answer it frequently. And this means good solutions fast. Now I use math models to make these decisions and there are programs called solvers that can take these models and determine the best decisions to make. But the thing is, in a realistic scenario, there are over 400,000 decisions to make and less than 10 minutes to make them. And these solvers are trying to make the best of every decision. But if I were to make the best 400,000 decisions, Granted, I'll get the least possible cost, but it will take weeks to come up with a transportation strategy. So what if, instead, I try to make 400,000 good decisions? This will allow me to take shortcuts, group similar decisions together and fix them before making the next group of decisions. So from all the possible routes, consider only the shortest. And along these short routes, find the cheapest way to move a product from point A to point B then find the minimum number of trucks to move all these products along this predetermined path. What I achieved so far is a good strategy in less than 10 seconds. But now I'm asking myself, can I do better? If I make different choices, can I move from a good strategy to a great one? Ultimately, this means great decisions faster, allowing the Ministry of Health to do so much better and guaranteeing you the healthcare quality you deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. We're already halfway through the master's presentations. And our next presenter is Mashid Keramatnejad from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Mashid is pursuing a master of science in chemistry. And her thesis title is a biophysical study of the impact of air pollutants on tear film lipid model membranes. Her three minute thesis title is the story behind the blink. Good luck, Mashid. It's the easiest thing in the world to blink. None of us ever really consider it. How we do it all the time with ease and how it protects our eyes from all sorts of dirt particles and pollutants, especially in those smog days. But did you know that there is an oily layer on the surface of our eyes that makes blinking effortless? Think of it similar to that oil deposit on top of your grandmother's delicious chicken broth. And think of the broth as your tears. 
Now, this oily layer actually has its own complex structure that makes it necessary for blinking. Now, remember, one of those horrible times when you had something in your eyes, that terrible feeling of a foreign body in your eyes that made blinking, the easiest thing in the world, extremely agitating. People with dry eye syndrome have to live with that all the time because for them, their oil tear layer is damaged. Now I work on creating a simplified model membrane which mimics the oil tear layer because of course, one of the major limitations of the field is collecting enough representative real tear samples to study. So we use surface chemistry methods to help us understand the structure of the oil tear layer. These methods help us visualize our model membrane as we compress and expand it, which mimics blinking. They also help us to measure the viscosity of our model membrane, which is actually what allows the oil tear layer to spread so easily across the surface of our eyes while blinking and without raking after multiple blinks. So if we understand its structure and its function in blinking, we can better understand how air pollutants such as ozone can damage it. Now, so far, I have identified the roles of the major components of the oil tear layer, which together actually create a unique multi-layered structure on the surface of our eyes that is necessary for blinking. Now, some of these components are actually quite vulnerable to chemical change via reacting with oxidants such as ozone that's found in environmental smog and their damage can cause dry eyes. So right now we are trying to understand exactly how this chemical change leads to dry eye syndrome. This can help us understand why more and more people in urban environments are getting dry eyes. It also takes us a step closer to creating more effective eye drops. So while blinking is the easiest thing in the world, it's that oil tear layer on the surface of our eyes that's the hero of our story. And that's something to appreciate the next time you blink. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mashid. Our next presenter is Carla Samuel from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Carla is pursuing a Master of Arts in Education Technology. Her thesis title is Improving Online Learning in Higher Education with Chatbots. And her three minute thesis title is Chatbots, the new virtual teaching assistant. Good luck, Carla. Since COVID-19, We've all been affected by Zoom fatigue. When you're trying to pay attention to a Zoom lecture, but you can't. I'm a first year student during the pandemic and I became interested in this phenomenon. I wondered how can educators manage online education in ways that support learners? My answer, let's create a virtual teaching assistant for a university course at Concordia in addition to Zoom lectures. My research is the first of its kind using a chatbot to do this. So what's a chatbot? Chatbots are computer programs designed to simulate conversations. I design chatbot conversations through text messaging using the course curriculum. Students can text the chatbot one-on-one -on -one, and the chatbot would respond by reinforcing lessons and quizzing students through gamification. Through a survey and focus group interviews, I would ask students if chatbots help them feel that they have three things essential to an online learning community. Social presence, teaching presence, and of course, thinking. Concordia students are spread all over the world in many different time zones, but chatbots are always up to answer student questions. Additionally, chatbots can be skilled to answer a large volume of questions to help professors and TAs better serve students. I'm at the beginning stages of my research, but the most important question I have for my thesis is, do chatbots help students in online courses finish? COVID-19 rocked the world of education. Educators had to respond overnight to the pandemic. Luckily, through digital technology, this allows flexibility for educators, but technology can increase inequalities for students who have trouble with remote learning. Chatbots offer a fresh way for educators to manage online learning. And by beating Zoom fatigue, the enemy of online learning, 
I hope my research inspires educators to find new and innovative ways to ensure that education is inclusive and accessible for all students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. Now we're on to our last presenter in the master's category, Zara Motagi Mogadam from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Zara is pursuing a Master of Science in Health and Exercise Science. Her thesis title is The Effect of Drugs of Alzheimer's Disease on the T Helper Cells. The three minute thesis title is Right Drugs to Mobilize Immune Cells. Good luck, Zara. There are 35 million people around the world who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. And maybe you know one of them, like me. As I remember, my mother always worried about Alzheimer because her dad died from Alzheimer. Alzheimer disease affects patients, their families, and caregivers, which most of them are families that provide 24 hours and seven days per week caring services. In our body, in our body various systems work together to keep our brain healthy. And one of these systems is immune system. Most important part of immune system, white blood cells doesn't work properly in Alzheimer patients. There are different population of the white blood cells. Some of them can make worse the disease increase and other part that can make and decrease the progression of the disease reduce in a patient. And my research question is, what does the combination of the drug and dosage can affect Alzheimer positively. I want to find the specific dosage and drugs that can affect the Alzheimer and use as a treatment or preventing way to the focus on the immune cells. How? First, take a blood from a donor and then add different dosage and different drugs to the blood at the plate at the laboratory. And finally, observe the effect of the drug on the cells. And when I will succeed, the next step is test the result of my thesis on a clinical study on Alzheimer patient. And in future, specialists may use the drug to treat the Alzheimer. At this time, unfortunately, drug just can decrease the symptoms, not treat the disease. And I want to do this to improve the quality of life of patients and families and to decrease the financial burden on the healthcare systems and for the peace of mind of loved ones and caregivers. On the other word, Alzheimer patient forgot how to lie and how to smile. And I want to remember them how to smile. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zara. Now this concludes the master's category presentations. Uh, thank you all the presenters, you did great. So these were very engaging talks. Now the audience comes into play. We invite you to take a moment to vote for your favorite master's presentation. We will post the link in the chat box and on Facebook. And please, please click on this link to uh, cast your vote. You will have around five minutes to do so before we move on to the presentations for the doctoral students. So please stand by and we'll be back shortly.
just a reminder, you have about two minutes to cast your vote if you haven't already done so. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we will now proceed with the, sorry, for some reason, I'm unable to change the slides. I'd like to continue with my, ah, there we go. To continue with the doctoral presentations. Uh, in the doc doctoral category, we will have a total of seven presentations. Six presenters will be competing in the English competition, and there will be one presentation as part of the francophone competition, Ma thèse en 180 secondes. So let's wish them all good luck. The first presenter is Alexa Ruel from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Alexa is pursuing a PhD in psychology. Her thesis title is Neural Evidence for Age-Related Deficits in the Representation of State Spaces. And her three-minute thesis title is The Choices We Make, Mapping the Aging Mind. Good luck, Alexa. When it comes to decision making, the saying with age comes wisdom may only be half the story. In 2016, Canadian seniors outnumbered children for the first time. As the number of seniors continues to increase, by 2036, as much as a quarter of our population could be over 65. Problem is, we still don't fully understand how aging affects decision making. As we age, we experience significant cognitive decline due to the deterioration of several brain regions. Unfortunately, this includes regions that support what we call goal-directed decision-making, like deciding which bus route to take given current traffic conditions. As we age, without the ability to rely on goal-directed decision-making, we rely on habits instead, like taking our usual bus route regardless of traffic. Being unable to engage in goal-directed decision-making can be limiting, frustrating, or even dangerous when these decisions are made by company CEOs or world leaders. My goal as a researcher in psychology is to make sure it isn't. Researchers hypothesize that older adults revert to habitual decision-making because they struggle to create a mental model of the decision-making environment. In the case of my bus route example, think of this mental model as a map of all possible bus routes and their delays due to traffic. This is critical for goal-directed decision-making. To test if this hypothesis holds true, I thought, what if we made this mental map easier to represent? Would older adults then engage in more goal-directed choices? Would their neural activity begin to look like that of younger adults who engage in goal-directed learning no problem? To test this, I had younger and older adults complete various decision-making tasks, which resemble video games. The point of each game? To make a series of decisions, to get as many points as you can. Easy, right? Well, like any good psychology experiment, there's a twist. The same choice didn't always lead to the same outcome. Sometimes participants would click a button to go right, but end up on the left. In one version of my game, this happened a lot, making it a lot harder for people to create a mental map of the game. In a second version, this happened a lot less, hopefully making it easier. 
Well, turns out making the game easier to represent did help older adults make their decisions, but only to some extent. They did indeed engage in more goal-directed decision-making, but their neural activity showed me that they still failed to create a mental model of my game. This study provides empirical evidence for the hypothesis that older adults do resort to habitual strategies because they have a hard time creating a mental model of the decision-making environment. Using this knowledge can help improve training programs or help modify existing technology to make sure that older adults can keep making goal-directed decisions, remaining autonomous and an active part of our society. Thank you. And thank you, Alexa. Our second presenter is uh, Rachel Thomas from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Rachel is pursuing a PhD in Humanities and Fine Arts. Her thesis title is Shrink, Story of a Fat Girl, a graphic novel exploring fatness in medicine and society. And her three minute thesis title is Illustration from the Epilogue of Shrink, Story of a Fat Girl. Good luck, Rachel. Shrink. Referring to the act of changing in size from something larger to something smaller, but also to the vernacular about a medical doctor. It's both a descriptive word in the sense of something changing in size over time, but could also be a command. Shrink is also the title of my graphic novel and thesis. It's based on my research in medicine and society that looks at obesity in contemporary Western culture. In starting my PhD, I realized that a lot of the information about obesity was being published in journals only accessible by academics, both price-wise and because of the jargon used. I wanted to find a way to reach an audience outside the institution, one that would be able to benefit from the research I was doing. And so my background in visual arts came into play and I decided to write and illustrate a graphic novel in a superhero comic style. And this is also important because women of different body sizes aren't often represented in traditional comic books. Because it's visual as much as research-based, Shrink falls into a category of medical humanities known as graphic medicine. Firstly, graphic medicine is used as a tool for education, either informing general populations of new information using visuals and text, but also informing healthcare professionals on the experience of living with illness or disability. Further, it becomes a platform for validation and acceptance for those facing stigma and also as a means to trouble stereotypes, which we know on the topic of obesity is a significant cause for not receiving adequate care. Shrink follows the journey of the book's unlikely hero, Piera, as she chooses to lose weight in a society that has dictated the social and medical dangers of being too fat. It explores topics like the social complications of fatness, the medical gaze upon the body, monstrous bodies, diet culture, body advertisements, and plastic surgery. It examines the critical notion that weight loss is always gospel, in addition to this idea about achieving a perfect body, obsessions about what's actually healthy, pushback from feminists and activists, and why ultimately it is so important for a person to demand ownership over their own body. This graphic novel is both a resource and a source of comfort for those struggling with obesity, but moreover, anyone who's ever struggled with their body. I'm pretty sure most of us have. And in the end, it's up to the reader to decide to shrink or not when faced with medical and societal expectations. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Our third presenter is Mudabir Abdullah from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Mudabir is pursuing a PhD in biology. His thesis title is Towards Humanizing the Proteasome Core in Yeast. And his three minute thesis title is Baker's Yeast, a distant cousin with human recycle bin. Good luck, Mudabir. Most of you will agree with me that recycling is a pretty good thing, right? We collect our waste and other unnecessary things, toss them in a trash bin and send for recycling. What will surprise you to know that each and every cell in our body essentially do the same thing. Yes, human cells also have a garbage disposal and a recycling system that keeps them neat and clean. One of the cellular garbage disposal system 
is called a proteasome complex or simply a cellular recycle bin. We cannot imagine to live in a dirty house without having a proper garbage disposal system, right? Same is the true with the human cells. If they are not able to clear their trash or recycle them, they become sick, potentially leading to several diseases that include cancer like multiple myeloma, neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Given the importance of this recycle bin in human cells, we need a model to study its role in different diseases. In my PhD, I'm trying to build this human recycle bin in a simple baker's yeast. Yes, the same yeast we use in a bread and beer. Now the question is, why yeast? First thing, working with the human cells is costly, it's very difficult, and often we don't have that much tools available. Whereas working with yeast is easy, it's simple, it's cheap, and it may come as a surprise to you that though the yeast does not look like us, but it is our distant cousin. And we share several thousand genes with the yeast. And guess what? This garbage disposal system is also common between the yeast and humans. As a synthetic biologist, I challenge yeast to live with the human genes. And so far, I was able to make 50% of this recycle bin in the yeast. My engineering simply involves cutting the yeast gene and pasting the human one. Engineering the entire human recycle bin in the yeast will be a great milestone in the field of synthetic biology. I believe that my humanized strands will serve as a great model to study different human disease and thousands of genes can be directly used on these strands to see whether a particular drug can restore the normal functioning of the recycle bin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mudabir. We're already halfway through the English presentations. Our fourth presenter. Fourth presenter is Trish Osler from the Faculty of Fine Arts. Tris is pursuing a PhD in art education. Her thesis title is Mapping Artistic Experience, Transdisciplinary Approaches to Understanding the Creative Process in Art Education. Her three-minute thesis title is Right Ideas, How Disruption Sparks Inspiration. Thank you, Trish. Good luck. Where do bright ideas come from and how? Inspiration. When you're solving a complex problem, Multiple networks in your brain are activated, generating possibilities, some mundane, some even crazy, but all trying to make that one key connection, that spark that illuminates the path to a solution. My research explores creative thinking and inspiration. I study how we can apply insights about creativity from artists and neuroscientists to make that aha moment easier to reach. I want to know what will increase the chances for inspiration to occur. Your brain's often working on a problem, even while occupied with some other task. In fact, inspiration's about making that unexpected connection to a long-standing curiosity or question. It comes together in a sudden flash of insight, like, like a light bulb going off in your head. But this aha moment doesn't come out of the blue. It's the product of a number of influences, some of which we can identify like long-term memory, and some we can actually control, like mindfulness. I developed activities which help us recognize the missing connection so that when it appears, our mind is prepared to jump on it. For example, priming can increase the chances of making that connection. It's like warming up before you work out. Now, for artists, that means breaking out of normal patterns, uh, introducing new materials and techniques, expressing complex ideas through visual metaphor or using counterfactual thinking like, what if? What if I did this instead? Can I change an outcome by changing my approach? Disruptive thinking strategies like these activate inspiration and this is a game changer for teaching. Imagine students of physics 
exploring uh, particle theory through improvisational dance. I've been testing thinking strategies at two research sites. Uh, art educators and an art science collaborative known as the Convergence Initiative, where art uh, artists, fine artists engage with neuroscientists. Um, where, <laughs> sorry. Um, I asked them to use priming counterfactual thinking and communicating with metaphors to see if this helped them make uh, new and surprising connections. And this was really fun. I'm still gathering data, but the initial findings indicate that learning activities specific to creativity inspire both groups to think differently. Scientists thinking like artists are discovering that using visual metaphors and um, methods, artistic methods that prime for inspiration alters their approach to complex ideas. Exploring how to ignite creativity may change the way we teach in the future. Try sparking your own creative thinking. Ask what if more often. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Yes, ask what if more often. Um, our next presenter is Felicity Hamer from the Faculty of Arts and Science. Felicity is pursuing a PhD in communication. Her thesis title is Developing Memory, Remembrance, Embellishment, and Hauntography. And her three minute thesis title is Developing Memory. Good luck, Felicity. In March 2016, I awoke to news of the fatal car crash that took a dear friend's life. I spent the morning tearing my place apart, trying to find a particular photograph of she and I's teens, far too silly and young to be at my brother's New Year's Eve party. It was a favorite photograph that always sent her into hysterics and prompted her storytelling. She repainted that night as she did all of our time together. My research is driven by this loss and by the eventual realization that all this remembering has continued, even in the absence of the physical photograph. And as my photo remains so central to this remembering, as it is both absent and yet somehow present, like a ghost, I named it my hauntograph. And I've since found others. Mentioned by friends or in literature, hauntographs are photographs that are misplaced or intentionally avoided, and yet still connected to memories of absent individuals. But why? And how does one explore an unviewable phenomenon? To further develop this concept of hauntography, I've been looking at viewable remembrance enacted upon or through photographic portraits. In my research, I look at additions of hair, text, reef photography, spirit photography, digital composites, all of these embellishments that slow down our reading of certain photographs. More than split second capture, these objects have the ability to speak across time and enact a kind of reunion. What do these mementos reveal about the role of the imagination in remembrance, especially as it is shown to continue even in the absence of the viewable object? If we can better understand what the bereaved do to portraits of loved ones, the role imagination plays in remembrance, we can offer more informed, compassionate support to the bereaved, avoid undervaluing these objects, and instead develop more effective applications of photography geared towards easing the pain associated with loss. In the current pandemic moment, we're increasingly compelled to maintain connections to others, to grieve losses collectively at a physical distance from one another through screens, through images. My research into bereavement through photography-based media is important, timely, and in need of a public that takes this topic seriously. The photograph that brought me to this inquiry is missing. And in a sense, this project traces my trajectory towards it. But I'm no longer chasing the physical photograph. I wanna know what her stories did to it. Thanks. Thank you, Felicity. Our final presenter for the English competition is Jessica Murphy from the School of Graduate Studies. Jessica is pursuing a PhD in the Individualized Program in Pure Science. Her thesis title is Adipose Tissue Senescence in Young Women with Childhood Onset and Adult Onset Obesity Before and After Moderate Weight Loss. And her three-minute thesis title is Shedding Light on Aging Fat. Good luck, Jessica. It's inevitable. We all get older. And one of the challenges we face as we age is staying healthy. But psst, I have a secret. 
What if I told you that the fountain of youth lies within your fat? Huh? I know what you're thinking. That squishy, yellowish stuff inside our bodies? You bet. Recent research has linked the aging of fat to age-related diseases, heart disease, diabetes. Bottom line, aged fat is sick fat. But this got me thinking, you see, heart disease and diabetes are no longer just diseases of the very old. In fact, people living with obesity often face these diseases as young adults or even teens. Could this mean they have accelerated fat aging? And what about people who have aged with obesity from childhood? Is their fat even older? As a health researcher who plays with fat, that's exactly what I set out to understand. I recruited adults who developed obesity at different ages, some as a child or teenager, and others later in life. With the help of a trusty medical doctor, I took a teeny tiny sample of their fat just below the skin, like a mini liposuction. I then brought the fat back to the lab and treated it with a special dye that illuminates signs of aging. But these signs of aging cannot be seen with the naked eye in broad daylight. So I spent many long hours in a small dark room with Mike, my microscope. I zoomed in on the fat to see, is it young and bright eyed or is it old and gray? What did I find? Well, as I had expected, adults with lifelong obesity had the oldest, sickest fat. Imagine being 30 years old, but having fat the age of an 80 year old. Now, is there anything we can do about this to prevent future disease? Well, the next piece of my research will shed light on whether we can reverse these signs of premature fat aging with personalized lifestyle interventions. And if there's one thing I want you to know, it's that there is hope we can restore that youthful fat glow. Thank you, Jessica. Now this concludes the presentation in the English category. Uh, notre participant pour le volet francophone est Marie Lécuyer de la Faculté des Arts et Sciences. Marie complète son doctorat en analyse sociale et culturelle. Le titre de sa thèse est Paradis artificiel, une enquête holographique d'existence post-mortem plus qu'humaine. Et le titre de sa présentation pour la compétition Ma thèse en 180 secondes est Dans le sillage des cimetières marins, une enquête anthropologique sur les traces d'un tournant océanique des rites funéraires à Hong Kong. Bonne chance, Marie. À Hong Kong, les vivants prennent parfois la place des morts, semblerait-il. Et les morts, quant à eux, délaissent le cercueil et l'enterrement pour l'urne et l'emmerrement. La pression urbaine est telle dans cet archipel que, contrairement aux traditions religieuses chinoises, qui insistent sur un retour au sol des morts, les rites funéraires ont pris un tournant océanique. Par exemple, des zones marines sont maintenant dédiées à la dispersion des morts. Des architectes ont imaginé des cimetières flottants et des sites internet sur lesquels il s'agit aussi de naviguer proposent d'abriter les défunts. En tant qu'anthropologue, j'étudie les courants sociaux et techniques qui font émerger ces cimetières marins et pose la question de savoir comment est-ce que ceux qui restent sur Terre visitent et commémorent leurs défunts en mer quand précisément les lieux tangibles de leur localisation semblent se dissoudre. Cela dit, ce ne sont pas juste les défunts humains qui m'intéressent ici, c'est aussi la perte d'habitats écologiques, eux aussi balayés par les vagues d'urbanisation qui traversent l'archipel. <coughs> bon. euh, alors pour enquêter sur cette convergence entre mort humaine et mort environnementale, je m'entretiens auprès des architectes et des entrepreneurs qui imaginent ces futurs funéraires. Je compte aussi arpenter les cimetières, monter à bord des bateaux mortuaires et surfe déjà régulièrement sur les sites internet dédiés aux défunts. 
j'intègre aussi à ma méthode une approche multimédia qui me permettra de projeter à mon tour une projection possible de ces futurs funéraires. Et pour cela, je m'équipe d'enregistreurs sonores et visuels de manière à capter les spectres de vie passée, mais aussi les spectres futurs, les aspirations environnementales, les rêves de modernité qui ensemble font émerger ces cimetières marins. Et c'est là une de mes intuitions de recherche, que ces cimetières marins émergent sous l'impulsion d'un courant océanique qui, paradoxalement, alimente aussi un courant d'urbanisation, dans la mesure où ces deux courants, dans leur complémentarité, contribuent à pousser les morts un peu plus par-dessus bord, pour faire de la place, nous dit-on. Mais de la place pour qui ou pourquoi exactement Car si les morts posent problème à ceux qui restent, et s'ils font obstacle aux pressions de l'urbanisation, c'est qu'ils incarnent malgré eux peut-être une une certaine résistance à l'oubli. Là où je veux en venir est que cette recherche est loin d'être macabre. Au contraire, en posant cette question de vie et de mort, j'essaie de redonner de la place à ceux qui nous habitent. Merci. Merci Marie. Now this concludes the doctoral category presentations. Judges will now leave the room to make their decision. Thank you again all presenters for your engaging talks. And we now invite the audience to take a moment to vote for their doctoral, uh, favorite doctoral presentation. As before, we will post a link in the chat box and on Facebook. And please click on the link to cast your vote and you will have about five minutes to do so. Just a friendly reminder, we're about halfway through the voting session.
Thank you very much. We will now proceed with the question and answer session. So if anybody here has some questions for the participants or, or general questions uh, for other um, of, uh, on other topics relating to this competition, uh, please, please feel free to uh, pop it in the Q&A box. And also, I believe there's somebody who's uh, monitoring our Facebook presentation, in which case I think you would put your question in the comments section. Now, let me see, do we have a question? If not, I'd like to start by something rather general uh, for all of our presenters. If anybody feels uh, uh, happy to answer this very, very basically, what motivated you to participate in the three-minute thesis competition? What, what, what was your idea going into this back in January? Yay, Carl, I would like to answer. Thank you, go ahead. Okay, I'm terrified of public speaking, but it looked like such a great challenge. So I told myself, just sign up. So I signed up. So then I said, okay, just go to one meeting. So I went to one meeting. And so just over time, I, I created a script and then I made a friend and now I'm competing. So it was really just one step at a time that led me here. Um, but it was a challenge to myself. So that's why it's so important to me. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Mashid. Uh, I had it on my mind to do this since last year, since I knew that this competition existed because it was 100% out of my comfort zone. And I really needed to put myself out of my comfort zone. So I'm, I'm very happy that it happened that I'm here. Anybody else? Yes, Trish. I found that it was really, really uh, tempting to try to condense a ton of research with a ton of jargon into three minutes. Um, I mean, that was that was tempting, but super hard. So I like Carla. I just kept saying, well, I'll take this one step and then I'll take the next step and I'll see how, how far I can go. But what what an exercise in um, really distilling something down to the very essence um, to democratize the the information make it accessible but also to just really put myself through through the paces of trying to get there it was hard <laughs> based on this uh, anybody else or those who've just answered what advice would you give someone who's interested in participating next year because this of course is an annual recurrence uh, but is hesitant because oh, i'm too shy i'm not sure what what Words of wisdom would you convey? Anybody? Okay, okay. Just sign up and just go to one meeting just to hear about it. You, you don't have to do it, just hear about it. And also for me, I haven't started my research yet and my research questions were this big. So this process helped me really distill what I want my research to be, like what exactly I want it to be. So. At first it was quantitative, but now I know it's qualitative. So I think if you are beginning and thinking about a thesis or you have a topic and you don't know where to go, try this competition. This will definitely give you a framework about what's most important to you. That's the advice I would give. Thank you. Yes, Zara, you had your hand up? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to advise my friend, sign up and just go and start to speaking. And it can be very, very great practice and experience for increase the self-confidence and decrease the fear for speaking in front of audience. That's it. Uh, we have a question from our audience. Um, how did this competition, the three minute thesis competition, improve or change your research project? Think about it. Uh, yes, Rachel. I think it gives you a really interesting opportunity to kind of condense your thoughts into one sort of small paragraph. Um, and I, I think that I found, for instance, that to be very helpful in kind of starting to write my support paper. 
um, just in terms of really like figuring out what the crux was of my thesis. So it, it definitely helps with that. Uh, yes, Alexa. Um, in my case, it really had me come back to why I'm doing this work, right? Because to get it to something that the public is going to be interested in, that's going to be kind of engaging, it's forcing us to think about why am I doing this? Why is this an important research question? And for me, it kind of brought me back to like, oh, right, okay, I'm doing this because it's important, because I hope to contribute in some way. Um, and that was just really a great experience for me and uh, something that I would definitely say is encouraging in this experience. On a, on a more technical aspect, um, today we are bombarded by images and videos and Snapchat and all sorts of things. Having to limit this to just one slide, one illustration to capture the crux of your research, uh, how did you all go about it? What was, what was the biggest hurdle there? Anybody? Uh... Alexa, you had your hand up? Yes, thank you. Um, I think for me, it was kind of moving away from how I would normally accompany what I'm saying in an academic setting, which is very technical, very complex. These images that kind of only speak to a certain number of people as well. So other people who are in my field and having to think about, okay, what's well, gonna help me communicate what I'm trying to say to someone who's not, you know, just few people I work with on a day to day um, and kind of moving back to something that speaks to everyone for me was an image. Um, so that kind of moving away from this academic framing was definitely the, the thinking here. Ooh, anybody else? Yeah, Mashid. I think going back to the basics for me, just go back to the basics to that starting point why you're doing this, that turned into an image in my head immediately and it helped me to move forward. I think also if I can speak for myself from last year, uh, there's a, perhaps, I wouldn't say a bigger challenge, but a different challenge uh, for us scientists uh, who work with rather abstract concept. We work with, we work at the bench with, for, for instance, Mudabir was explaining like a recycling bin inside cells. And we, we have also um, different types of, of uh, scientific concepts that we need to illustrate. And, and whereas uh, anybody in social sciences, then you have ideas that you have to convey. What, how do you start uh, determining what image you want to use and how you're going to tweak it to your research. For me, uh, when I started my first coaching, like I came with a lot of scientific terms, like a lot of jargons. And then I'm thankful to my coach, like they made me to understand that, look, we don't have a scientific audience here. You have to make those images that will be have a great appeal for the general audience. In that context, I'm very thankful to this 3MT, the coach who made us to uh, like decipher the actual scientific knowledge and make it so simple for the general public. Uh, Marie, est-ce que tu as levé la main? Marie, avais-tu quelque chose à nous uh, communiquer? Yeah, on, on this notion of image, um, you know, for, for some researchers here, I think also the image is actually key to the research itself. So it's not just a matter of illustration, it's also a component of your argument, basically. And so to me, at least, uh, finding the right picture was really a good, a good question for my research itself. How do you not go illustrative and how do you uh, show something that is also ethically possible? Because in my case, at least I talk about death, so I cannot show, I don't want to show any kind of images. So that was really a challenge of like, how do you, how do you evoke the thing you talk about in a way that actually contributes to your, to your talk? Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was also thinking, for me, it was a, um, a voyage of self-discovery when I took part last year. Uh, does anybody here felt that it changed them fundamentally? Maybe not like right down to your core, but what 
what have you been able to figure out about yourself and your capabilities uh, as part of the exercise? Uh, Jenny Ann? Yes, so definitely for me, like speaking in front of like a general audience, a lot of people and also like having to remember this script, but also having to act it. So you, you kind of remember the script, but then you should not just like literally speak the script. You have to kind of act it and show the emotion that the audience should feel about what you're saying. So this for me, I didn't think I was kind of capable of doing this. So I really had to practice a lot, like look at myself in the mirror when I was saying it, asking my friends and family, like, do you feel this emotion when, I, when I'm talking about this? And this is not something as a scientist that I, I thought I was capable of doing, so, yeah. Uh, Trish? Well, I, I think, uh, well, I agree with Jenny Ann. I think it's um, that, that challenge of putting all those components together is, is critical, but um, I, I think, I think I already knew that I was prepared to take on challenges, but I, I don't think I was um, as aware of how much um, dedication and commitment to this it would take. I think all of us here um, sign up for or are asked to, to try for things like this competition because there's something in us that inspires us uh, and dedicates us to just being our best and trying our hardest. And even if we can't do it, even if we flop or forget our words, <laughs> we, we, I think, set those challenges up for ourselves because we have a, a standard that we want to try to achieve. And there's a degree of personal competition within ourselves, I think. Um, so that's, that's a motivator. Um, and then overcoming things that maybe dissuade you from persevering that's another motivator um, because it, you have to grit your teeth and keep going even when you're terrified or you know you're gonna forget your words or you're gonna punctuate a line with the wrong action. It's gonna look stupid. Uh, so overcoming those things and persevering, that's, that's a big part of it. Um, just remaining dedicated to a, a higher standard and trying to keep your, your eyes on it. Yeah. Again, speaking for myself, the big challenge last year is that we were very suddenly and unexpectedly moved to an online uh, presentation mode, whereas it used to be on stage. And of course, uh, the coaching was geared towards appearing live in front, in front of warm bodies staring at you. So that, that was another, another hurdle. But somebody's asking in, in the Q&A section, um, how, how do we get from signing up to finally presenting. And yes, there are at least uh, three uh, coaching sessions. People sign up, we have a general information session, then we start building our script. And then through repeated rounds of coaching, we narrow it down, we tailor it. We also get feedback on the, the slides um, that we wish to, to present. So all of this, like I said earlier, it, this goes back to January. So it, it's been four months in the making. And I, I trust that you're all rather relieved that it, you made it, it, it's behind you and, and you did it. So um, any, any special thoughts of how you're gonna celebrate this and how you're gonna encourage other people around you <laughs> to, to go through with this perhaps next year? Yes, Rachel. I mean, I'm sure I'm speaking for most of the grad students here, but I'm going right back to work after this, actually. <laughs> right back, yeah, everybody's like, yes, yes, we are. Right back to work on thesis stuff. So that's how I'm celebrating um, finishing this. But for people who are going to try to take it next year, um, don't be afraid to do it. It's, it's an interesting experience. It's gonna help you really think about your research in a different way. And even if you're terrified of speaking in public, it's, it's not that threatening, like it's not a threatening space. Um, and people are there to listen to you and to listen to what you're doing and are interested in what an academic is doing in that world and explaining it in a way that everyone can understand. So people are there to listen to you. So don't be afraid to, to join, it's, it's been fun. Yeah, Amanda. Um, so as somebody that is studying education, um, to me, it's really important to participate in things like this, no matter how much I don't want to. And I didn't want to, but it was, I know it was good for me. It was like eating broccoli and I do feel good having done it. 
And the reason for that, and I think even people outside of education, if you're in academia, you're going to end up teaching sometimes or TAing sometimes. And we ask students to stand up and present and do things they're not comfortable with all the time. And we're standing up there, we're presenting too, and we forget that we've gotten used to it. We didn't begin that comfortable in front of a group. So I think it's really important to put ourselves in situations like this, where we're literally being judged. Do you remember what that feels like to make us more compassionate for our students who don't always have an option to sign up or not? Right. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been uh, advised that the judges have now returned and uh, we will be uh, able to announce finally who the winners of this year's competition are. Uh, on to the awards. Now to announce uh, the um, master's winners, runner up and winners, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ursula Eicher to say a few words, please. Well, thank you, Sylvie, and thank you to all the presenters of this afternoon. It was certainly a fun way to spend a Friday afternoon, despite the sunny weather, um, because it all did a great job. It was um, very entertaining, funny even, um, and you certainly all managed to convey the messages um, of your work very well. So it was actually a very tight ranking that came out of our three independent um, evaluations. But of course, um, we, we came up to a, to a ranking in the end, which is always difficult, given that it was all um, really good and very, very varied. Um, so we had a lot of different domains and it's really hard to, to compare uh, sort of hardcore science um, work with some um, more social or humanities driven work. But um, so we came to a conclusion and I'm, I'm very happy to um, announce the runners up winner of this uh, master competition, which is Sarah Mutagi Mogadam who presented the right drugs to mobilize immune cells. So congratulations. Okay, if that's all the applause you get in this online environment, so no loud clapping, unfortunately. Um, we come to the uh, winner of the master competition and due to an excellent performance, very expressive um, story, the winner of the master competition is Mashit. Kara Matneyat with the story behind a blink. And Sylvie seems to like it. <laughs> Congratulations. To yes, yes, I, uh, I didn't vote. I, I did not take part in anything. I wanted to remain neutral, but I'm chemistry, she's chemistry. So yes, way to go, Mashid. Now uh, to announce the winner up and the uh, the winner for the PhD section, uh, I would like to invite, let me see, I uh, have it here in my notes. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Eric Filion. Yes, well, thank you uh, for, for introducing me and thank you uh, to all the presenters uh, slash competitors. Uh, you really all did a terrific job. Um, and I, I know what I'm talking about because I did this several years ago. Uh, and I'm always amazed at how much uh, you can actually learn in three minutes when you're actually sitting in the audience and, 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 and you know, absorbing all this really uh, exciting information about really inspiring research uh, that is being done at Concordia University right now and being in Toronto. Uh, it's nice to see uh, that things are thriving in Montreal. So congratulations to all of you. And I'm here to announce the PhD winners uh, and uh, I am going to start with the PhD runner-up. Uh, and so the PhD runner-up is Jessica Murphy uh, with a presentation titled Shedding Light on Aging Fat. Congratulations. So I can imagine the applause. Uh, and now I'm going to announce the PhD winner. Uh, and so first place, uh, Mudabir Abdullah, presentation titled Baker's Yeast, a Distant Cousin with Human Recycling Bin. Congratulations to uh, Mudabir and Jessica, and thank you again for your presentations. Yes, uh, 
yes, and now on to the part where the audience actually had a role to play, the people's choice from, from your votes. I'd like to say, uh, invite Dr. Milagros Salas Prato to give us uh, the results of that competition. Thank you so much. I thank you for inviting me. It has been a pressure and also a privilege to be with you and to hear all of your uh, presentations, which were actually wonderful and very difficult to judge on <laughs> and make a decision and only choose one. So you're all winners in spite of, you know, the winners that we happen to have chosen. Uh, so for the master's presentation, the people's choice is Carla Samuel uh, with the title, Chatbots, the new virtual teaching assistant. And for the PhD, Jessica Murphy, Shedding Light on Aging Path. So congratulations to the winners and all the participants. And thank you. Thank you all for everything. Best of luck. Well, thank you. Thank you, to the judges. And thank you also to all our participants. I'd like to mention at this point that Marie Lécuyer, who uh, took part in the French uh, presentation, will now move on to the next level to represent Concordia at the Matez en 180 competition. Uh, I think it's slated for May. Uh, so yeah, you did great. There you are. Congratulations once again. Thank you uh, to our judges for spending the afternoon with us and your feedback was most appreciated. And special thanks, like I said earlier, this goes on through several levels of coaching. So we have guest coaches. We have, of course, our Brad's Pro Skill uh, expert, Nadine Beko. Sorry, something is wrong. Can't see my what I'm supposed to be reading. <laughs> Nadine Bekush, Pamela Taj, Christian Meyer, and Rasha Sheikh Ibrahim, and also our guest coaches who uh, lend a hand uh, halfway through the the process to to bring in. Uh, their, their uh, wisdom as well. Brad Nelson, Sonia Di Marlo, Vanessa Madirosan, and Shailene Pierpol. Vanessa and Shailene were winners last year. And myself, I took part, and it was great uh, to be uh, invited. It was honored. I was honored to be invited to take part in this project. Thank you to our audience for your support. As we said earlier, um, hashtag 3MTCU2021 and hashtag Canada3MT. Uh, to be followed for uh, this year's uh, competitions. And last but not least, thank you Fort Space uh, for your uh, valuable uh, support and for hosting this event. Now on to Anna for the final word. And thank you, Sylvie, for the very important job of moderation today. You did wonderfully. Congratulations. That was great. Oh. Um, I'll just remind, I know that there's still unanswered questions in the Q&A. So great that so many of you had uh, wanted to participate in this way and so great that you were able to congratulate everybody in this manner. Um, I would just, there has been some questions about the recording. So I'll just remind folks that yes, indeed, we have recorded the event. So uh, on that note, we wish you all a very great afternoon. We congratulate all of the presenters once again for a fantastic job and uh, really kind of inspired a moment together in the Zoom space here today, I think for all of us. So thanks everybody, we'll be closing up now. Congratulations again, have a wonderful weekend. See you next time. <laughs>